Good morning, everyone. My name is Mindy Epps, National Product Manager with Graybar, and I would like to welcome you to Graybar's G2 Talk presentation, Tips for Workplace Safety, Arc Flash Hazards and Ground Fault Safety. This talk is a part of a webinar series we offer each month for our customers. We have a great discussion lined up for you today, but before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple housekeeping items. First, if you are one of the first 50 people to join in on the presentation, you will receive a coupon for a free courtesy cup of coffee from Graybar as a thank you for your time today. Also, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a box for Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We'll address as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. Lastly, G2 Talks are all archived on graybar.com's website, so you will be able to review this presentation again or recommend it to others. We're happy today to team up with Eaton's Busman Business and Hubble. As a full-service distributor, Graybar works alongside Busman and Hubble to provide everything you need to help prevent accidents, protect employees, and be OSHA compliant. You can visit graybar.com to learn more about our solutions. At this time, I'm happy to introduce today's speakers. To kick off the presentation, we'll discuss ARC Flash Risk Assessment with Dan Neeser, Field Application Engineer at Busman. Dan has been at Busman for almost 20 years and specializes in training on the design and application of overcurrent protective devices and electrical distribution systems in accordance with NEC and equipment in accordance with various product standards. He is a senior member IEEE and also involved with NEMA, UL, NFPA, and IAEI. Next, we'll talk with John McFarland, a Senior Director at Hubble Wiring Device Kellum, another 20-year veteran who has held various positions, including Ground Fault Product Manager at Hubble. In his current role, John is responsible for all delivery systems like floor boxes, raceway, fire rate, and more. So without further delay, I will turn things over to Dan Neeser to begin today's presentation. Take it away, Dan. Thanks, Mindy. I appreciate it very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Dan Neeser. I'm a field application engineer with um, Busman. And if you have any questions uh, you'd like to uh, discuss after this, uh, again, feel free to use the Q&A window, as well as uh, my email address, which is shown on this first slide, if you have any questions after the session you'd like to uh, pose to me. The uh, first thing we'd like to talk about is uh, just what's required as far as our flash is concerned with regards to the National Electrical Code. As you can see, we do have a basic requirement in NEC 110.16, and I should mention uh, anytime I have text in red uh, that's shown as in this slide, that represents changes that were uh, new to the standard. So um, as you can see here, uh, one reference I had was for 70E. Uh, was 2012, as you'll find out, the current edition now is 2015. But basically, if you look at this section of code, it really just says that we must provide a warning label. Um, we don't actually have to identify the actual hazard for this per the code. Um, what we deal with is, in my, moving my next slide here, is we have to deal with the safety standards and regulations. And that's really what's going to drive this presentation this morning. Um, what are the OSHA requirements and what are the NFPA 70E requirements? Um, as you can see here, OSHA is uh, the regulation. This is the law, if you will, and as such, this is often termed the shall. Um, one issue with the OSHA requirements are that they are performance-based. Um, they tell you what you have to do, but they don't tell you how to comply. That's how 70E comes in. 70E is often referred to as the how. Um, it's not re required to be adopted um, uh, in, as far as the law is concerned, but it's typically the most uh, logical choice to, to use when it comes to uh, complying with uh, the OSHA requirements. So it shows you how to comply. And of course, as mentioned here earlier, the new edition is the 2015 edition. Um, this is really kind of a nice overview of some of the key OSHA requirements. I think many people think that uh, the real driver here is 70E and that they have to follow 70E, and that actually is not the case. Um, 70E is a great method on how to comply, but this kind of shows you the requirements uh, when it comes to OSHA. So for OSHA, we have to do a workplace hazard analysis. 
We have to train and educate both qualified and unqualified people and apply the PPE tools needed to do the, uh, the work safely. And as you can see there in the center, the real key thing here is documentation. With uh, getting into NFPA 70E, what I've highlighted here first is the uh, first article, uh, in, well, it's article 130.2, um, but it talks about the justification for energized work. Uh, many people think, well, if it's a low risk hazard, I can just go in there and work it. Um, you really first need to, to justify the, uh, the reason why you are going in there. And there's really only two um, good justifications. Either one, there are additional hazards or increased risk, and that used to say greater hazards. And again, uh, the red text shows uh, changes uh, to the, uh, the 2015 code. So uh, previously it was identified as greater hazard, now it's additional hazards or increased risk or infeasibility. If you look at these two reasons, the, the primary driver here is the infeasibility one. Uh, there are many cases when you uh, are going to have a no hot work policy, but uh, in order to verify de -energize, the equipment is actually de-energized, you have to go in there and during that process you have to assume it's de-energized, or it's mm -hmm. energized when doing um, the, the absence of voltage testing. So in many cases, even if you have a no hot work policy, you're going to have to have the arc flash hazard analysis or PPE per the tables that's uh, suitable for that installation, even to just verify lack of uh, or the absence of voltage. Um, the next section is talks about the justification for work, and this is something that's new. Um, there's been a real drive to to say that in some instances you do not have to have art flash uh, PPE, if you will, and they decided to put in a condition for that. And we'll we'll see this later on when it comes to the table method. We'll talk about later in this presentation. But it talks about normal operation, and under some conditions, uh, if I have a normal, what's considered normal operation, and I have these conditions, the equipment's properly installed, it's properly maintained, uh, the doors are closed and secured, and covers are in place, and there's no evidence of impending failure, um, there might be a condition where doing a certain task, provided those uh, conditions apply, we don't have to wear PPE. And then there's an informational note there, and I captured two of the first three. It talks about what it means with regards to proper installation, i.e. installed per the NEC, um, or properly maintained, and that would be per the manufacturer's instructions or consensus standards, such as perhaps the uh, NFPA 70B. And there's also a little bit of a note on there that's not shown on the slide here that talks about impending failure, and what would be an example of that. Moving into the arc flash risk assessment, um, here we have, I used to say arc flash hazard analysis, now the term is referred to an arc flash risk assessment. Um, it talks about the, the basic things you have to do for that, so there's a new one, um, and that's been kind of put in from a list, from a text to a list item mode, but basically we have to do, identify the safe work practices, the arc flash boundary, and the PPE to be used within the arc flash boundary. Uh, part two talks about uh, the fact that we need to review and possibly update our study. Uh, if we do a, an analysis, of, for instance, every five years. So I know this is a, a big issue for a lot of people. Uh, they've, they've done the study, and they probably have reached this five-year period as of now. So we're going to see a lot of opportunities where uh, companies are coming back, and we're going to have to re review the study that was previously done and updated if, if uh, needed. Uh, part three talks about, and there was no change here, it just talks about the condition of maintenance. And again, that was really a, uh, a big issue in the, in the past and the current edition of 70 years. We need to identify that we uh, properly maintain equipment. If not, we really don't know what can happen with regards to the arc flash hazard. This next slide talks about uh, the, the variety of informational notes that are covered. Uh, some key changes here, uh, informational note number one, 
it talks about, again, that the equipment's not properly installed or maintained. Um, PP selection based on its energy levels or the PP category method may not provide adequate protection. So again, if we don't maintain our equipment properly, we may not fully understand what the arc flash hazard is. Uh, another change or the big change in information note three, um, some editorial changes there, but uh, the big issue is that uh, the big change there is the reference to Annex O. Um, so that talks about some safety design related requirements and, and how you can improve the safety based upon uh, proper design. And last, informational note number five, uh, it just added the title of IEEE 1584. We'll talk more about that standard here coming up. And it also, just uh, before it used to reference uh, systems of 240 volts or less, they deleted that, and now it just says for three-phase systems. And that's an important uh, issue there as well, as we've only really done testing when it comes to three-phase systems. We assume that's the worst case. Moving on to the uh, arc flash hazard risk assessment. So we have the basic requirements and some information on those we just covered. Now we're moving on to a new part here, and in Part A, uh, they again stress the importance of documentation. So, um, per uh, the requirements of 70E, as well as the requirements for OSHA, we have to document that we've done an arc flash risk assessment. Uh, part B talks about the arc flash boundary. Um, there used to be a note there that it was 50 volts or less, um, uh, but now that has been deleted from that. Text, and they added um, the inf informative. So whenever we talk about an annex, um, it's informative, which means it's not required to be followed. It's just there for information and guidance, but it is not mandatory to follow that. And then we added uh, part two, which allows the arc flash boundary to be determined by the table method in lieu of calculations. So the boundary either can be calculated, and you would typically use the formulas in Annex D, or you can use the tables and they will tell you what the arc flash boundary is based upon a given task. Moving on to part C of the arc flash hazard risk assessment, um, we have two uh, choices when it comes to selecting PPE and the change here in the, in the parent text of C indicates that you have to do one or the other, but you cannot use both. So they don't want you to mingle between using the analysis method and then try to convert over to the table. So it would never be appropriate, for instance, to calculate the incident energy and then use the tables to address for that hazard. Um, again, you have some guidance and it shows you uh, that there is an annex, an annex D um, in an Annex H, there's uh, some informative annexes that show you how to select a PPE based upon the incident energy analysis. And in part two, it talks about using the, the uh, arc flash PPE category method. So that used to say hazard risk category. Now it's termed uh, referred to as the arc flash PPE category method. And uh, it just allows you to, to use that select the PPE appropriate for that. Um, Many people often wonder what's the best method, either the analysis method or the PPE method. And quite frankly, it, it depends upon where you're at as far as uh, uh, complying with the OSHA requirements. In many cases, you're forced to use the category method because you have to start somewhere. And eventually, you might go to the analysis method. But uh, the category method is a great way to start getting compliant with the OSHA requirements. When it comes to doing an analysis method, most companies that offer this service are going to use the IEEE 1584 method. Um, it represents all tasks and all fault currents. So what you'll see with the table method is that in the table method, you might actually dress for a lower hazard if the task is less likely to result in an arc flash. In this case, uh, when we do the analysis method, we calculate the worst case, and so regardless of task, identifies the worst case arcing hazard, not the, it doesn't factor into a uh, consideration risk, if you will, of an arc flash hazard. I mentioned earlier that you can use the table H3B for guidance on PPE selection. It's not required. And also be aware there are many manufacturer tools that will help you identify the hazard, arc flash hazard, based upon given both of fault currents and the type of lower current protection used.
Moving into the table method, so again, we can either do an analysis or we can use the PPE category method. If we do use the PPE category method, we did add a first a new table here. And looking at this, you have some parameters for this table. It could be either an AC or a DC application. Um, there's a task involved. And then the next column takes into consideration the equipment conditions. And based upon how you answer those questions, uh, it'll tell you whether you need our flash PPE or not. So the first step now we use the table method is to refer to this table. It's a task table, but it tells you whether or not you need PPE, and we factor in the equipment condition in that analysis. Um, once we have determined if, um, so we've, we've gone to that first table and we looked at our task and found out that yes, PPE is required. Um, in that case, we would go to the second table and look at our specific tasks. And this is where we have not only specific task and equipment, but we also have parameters. Okay, it's very important to understand that when we developed these tables, we being the NFPA 70 committee, they looked at these parameters, and these parameters include things such as available short strip current, um, opening time, working distance. All of these um, tables or all these parameters affect how we arrived at the associated art flash PPE category. So, for instance, if it was a panel board. 250 volts or less, you'd have to meet those parameters. And if you met those parameters, you'd have a PPE category of one, and you'd have the arc flash boundary of 19 inches. Um, an important thing to note here is that there is no category zero anymore. It's just either a one, two, three, or four. So they did eliminate the uh, HRC zero, if you will. And then, of course, we would select PPE per table 130.70. C16. That tells us how to desk dress based upon a given PPE. Um, my last slide here talks about the labeling requirements, and we've done some rearrangement of this uh, of this section. So we first start off with the fact that uh, we have to indicate the system voltage and the boundary. That was also indicated in previously, but we moved it up in the list items. Um, item three, we've enhanced the marking requirement to make it clear that you either mark the incident energy and the corresponding working distance or the arc flash PPE category, um, but not both. So you would never mark uh, the incident energy and PPE HRC category, for instance. And this was a common mistake. A lot of labels that, that are shown out there, they do mark both. Um, this says you would mark only one or the other. Um, as an other alternate, you have, of course, the mark the minimum arc rating of clothing, or uh, for some conditions, you can uh, mark a site-specific level of PPE, and that's something that uh, means something only to that specific employer. So there might be a industrial facility, and they do their analysis, and they decide they have perhaps a two-level category, level one and level two, and that means nothing to anyone except for that facility and that owner. Um, if you look further on in uh, 130.5D, we also see that we've asked some, uh, added some additional text here um, where the review of the arc flash hazard assessment identifies a change that requires the label to, uh, to be inadequate, inaccurate. The label shall be updated. So, again, that kind of goes and, and corresponds with the five-year period we should review. And if we find that it does need to be uh, updated, we must do that. And the last sentence that's been added just talks about that the responsibility for that documentation, installation, maintenance of this field mark label is solely by the owner of the facility. So that is my last slide that I'm covering today. Um, again, I'd like to encourage you to use the Q&A tab. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions for me, um, we'll be able to answer those uh, at uh, the end of the session. Uh, so with that, I will be turning it over to John McFarland. And John, if you'd like to take it away right now, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, very, very informative presentation on Art Flash. Uh, nice job. Um, as Dan mentioned, my name is John McFarland. I'm the Senior Director of Commercial Marketing here at Hubble Wiring Systems. Um, today, we're going to concentrate our discussion on ground fault safety. Um, you know, my opening slide 
kind of shows you some of the innovative new products that Hubble has launched over the last 12 month period. Um, Hubble is very safety conscious. Um, most of the products that we've launched in the last 12 months are geared towards making your facility safer. And that's what today's presentation is going to emphasize is a general understanding of ground fault products, a general understanding of how a ground fault functions, um, and then some of the standards changes that are taking place um, in, during the month of June of this year that will allow you to um, you know, be up to speed going forward. Understanding ground faults, um, there's really two different categories, and we're going to split this up separately so that you understand um, the difference between the, the versions of ground fault products that exist. We're going to talk about portable ground faults first, and then we're going to transition over to receptacles um, to give you some, some information on the receptacle portion of that. Now, the first thing I want to point out is when we're talking about ground fault products from Hubble, we're talking about type A ground fault protection. That is ground fault products that trip within the four to six milliamp range that are designed for people protection. There is also ground fault products that exist that are designed for equipment protection. That is type B ground faults. Uh, there's, there's product that trips between five and 30 milliamps. There's 30 milliamp and higher. Everything we're going to talk about today is going to be designed around people protection and the products that are available to protect the people both working in your facility as well as the public that accesses your facility on a daily basis. So why is ground fault important? Um, there's about 700 deaths per year. Now, some of these metrics that I put up on this slide are a little dated, but it just proves the, it just kind of leads you down the path of, you know, why ground fault protection is so important to, um, to businesses, to every public building. Um, you got about 700 deaths a year as a, as, that are accounted for because of ground fault uh, issues. Um, 34,000 shocks where it doesn't result in death but results in possible injuries. Uh, it's currently the second leading fat fatality item in the construction industry. So when you're dealing with job sites and people losing their, losing their lives or getting injured on job sites, ground fault is a major, a major focus for there. It's also, to businesses in the United States, it's a big drain on profitability. So ground fault results in, you know, people missing time from work, downtime in production, um, and all those other various factors that are going to impact the ultimate bottom line productivity and operating profit that uh, corporations rely on to, um, you know, to exist in today's very competitive world. Ground fault products were introduced to the marketplace back in the 70s. And, and this graph that I'm demonstrating here gives you a nice illustration of the correlation between the presence of ground fault safety in the, in the marketplace and the reduction of electrocutions that have, trans, that have happened during that same time period. So as you can see, back in 1970, there was no ground fault, and we had you know, 700 or so fatalities in every, any given year. Now, this chart's a little dated. It only goes out to about 2,000. Um, but this really does a nice job of kind of planting the seed as to you know, what is UL's focus with ground fault. And when we get into the discussion on ground fault receptacles, you'll understand where they're, where they're driving. But UL, Underwriters Laboratories, is basically trying to drive the UL standards in such a way that we bring this number to zero. And we'll talk about some of the UL changes that are happening in the coming years or in the coming months. But the, the ultimate goal that Underwriters Laboratory has is to continue to tweak the UL standards of UL 943 to you know, continue to make every building, every school, every facility, every job site a safer, a safer place. Okay, when we start talking about what are the effects of an electrical shock, and again, I just want to real quickly cover 
how a ground fault works here and give you a basic understanding of what happens if a ground fault does exist. As you can see here in the yellow, if you have a, milli, a milliamp of leakage, then you have a perception. You can feel that one milliamp. When you get up to five milliamps, which is the upper peak level where a ground fault must trip to meet UL standards, um, that's about five milliamps. If you get up to the greater than 10 milliamp range, that's what we call the let go threshold. So though, if you have 10 milliamps of fault current going through you, you physically cannot let go of whatever you're holding onto at that time. Your, muscle, your muscles freeze, you can't let go, and you're in big trouble. Uh, and right on up through where you see 15 milliamp, 30 milliamps, breathing difficulties, and then when you get up into the um, half an amp up to four amps, you're actually talking ventricular fibrillation, and then ultimately four amps and higher uh, heart paralysis and, and obviously death. So we need to limit this possibility. So how does a ground fault do that? Um, a lot of people see ground faults. They know ground faults exist. They know they use ground faults. Many people don't understand exactly what they're physically doing and how they're protecting people. So just quickly, we're not going to spend a lot of time doing this, but I just want to give you a basic understanding. Pictured here is a normal circuit. In a normal circuit, you have a line and a, you have a, you have a line and a neutral. You have current coming in, current coming out to complete the circuit. Common sense, right? Well, in this particular illustration, we have six amps coming in and six amps coming out. That is your normal standard circuit. Whatever the load is, that could be eight amps, nine amps, ten amps, whatever it is. Whatever you have coming in on the line, you're coming through the load and you're coming back on the neutral. They should be in balance. A ground fault basically monitors those circuits and checks that the current coming out is equal to the current coming back. So if you have six amps coming into the load, you better have six amps coming back. So when we talk about the fact that a GFI trips in that four to six milliamp range, then what we're talking about is if that load balance, if that six amps coming in isn't six amps coming back, then you've got a problem and the ground fault has to do its job and trip and take the power away from that circuit. So in this illustration here, um, you've got six amps coming in to your load. There's a ground fault that's occurred. You can see the, the, the person in the illustration is standing in some water. He has basically become the de facto ground to that situation. So that 0.1 amps of leakage is now going right through his body. He is becoming the ground. And if there's no ground fault receptacle present in that situation, then that person um, gets shocked. So the ground fault receptacle basically is going to monitor the load, what's coming back on the neutral. If there is a leakage between 4 and 6 milliamps, the ground fault will trip and theoretically save the person. When we get into portable ground faults, there's one difference between a portable ground fault and a receptacle. And a portable ground fault, as we see here, there's several illustrations of portable ground faults here. Um, portable ground faults have an open neutral relay. And I'll talk about what an open, open neutral relay is for you in a second. But, you know, here you can see, you know, you've got employees using power tools, remote access. Portable GFIs allow you to carry the ground fault protection with you. You can take it right out on the plant floor, out to the job site, wherever you're working, you can bring the ground fault protection with you. There's a, there's a variety from Hubble and other manufacturers of portable ground fault products that you can utilize. You know, in the center is a picture of a, a ground fault plug. You know, this is, this is the type of product that you can actually wire right onto every power cleaner in the building, and now the employee has no choice but to plug it in and always have a ground fault plug on that product. The other products are more portable in nature, and this allows, you know, the customers to basically check it out of the tool shop when they're checking out, checking out any other tool, take it out to where the workplace is, and, and then, you know, from a standpoint of making, of, you know, internal policies, internal safety procedures, that type of thing, these type of uh, portables allow those, um, allow those workers to use the product and, and make sure they're safe. What you don't want to do is make your own ground fault extension cords. 
This is a photograph that was taken at a facility very close to the Hubble corporate office here in Shelton, Connecticut, where a contractor had basically made his own ground fault uh, safety product. This does not meet OSHA standards for portable ground fault. Okay, so this has two ground fault receptacles. He's ganged up a couple steel boxes. He's put a, a cord connector on the end, and he's fed it, and he's using this to provide protection. You know, it's probably better than no ground fault protection at all, but again, it does not meet the UL standard. Why doesn't it? Ground fault receptacles do not have the open neutral relay protection. Typically, receptacles are installed in, in a wall. The, the wires that are, that are feeding the receptacle are protected either in conduit or an MC cable. And so those cables aren't likely to be damaged. On a job site, the likelihood of the cable actually being damaged is greater. So a portable ground fault must have what we call an open neutral relay. And that basically what that does for you is if you have an extension cord running across the facility, tow motor drives over it, neutral cord gets severed, you still have power coming in on that line. You don't have a circuit closed so you don't have power to your equipment, but you do still have power on that line, and you can still become the ground fault mechanism. You can still get shocked even though there is no circuit and that piece of equipment isn't operating. So portable ground faults must have the added safety of having an open neutral relay. So if that cord that's feeding the equipment has the neutral cut, the GFI must trip. So it trips under a ground fault, it trips under a, re a neutral being cut. And that's why, you know, the picture on the left where the problem is somebody's made a homemade uh, ground fault, not acceptable. You must use uh, an OSHA approved unit that has open neutral relay. Within portables, there's also two varieties of portables. And it's important to understand the difference. And every manufacturer, you know, not just Hubble, every manufacturer makes both manual and automatic reset portables. So I want to just spend a minute making sure you understand the difference and where you should use each. A manual reset unit requires you to reset the ground fault every time you plug it in. So every time you dis you unplug it, put it back in the storeroom, and you go to use it again, you must reset the ground fault the minute you provide power to it. An automatic reset ground fault portable will operate immediately upon plug-in. Okay, so don't be confused with an automatic reset in terms of an actual ground fault. So if you have a ground fault condition and the unit does its job, whether it's a manual or an automatic, if the unit does its job, it senses a ground fault and it trips, both cases you must reset manually to bring power back. But a manual reset unit, every time you plug it in, has to be reset, and automatic will automatically power up when you plug it in. So there's a couple applications where you might want to use the, the versions, the manual and the automatic. So just to give you some examples, when you're using power tools, and in, I mean 90% of the applications you're going to have um, you're going to want to have a manual reset unit. You don't want somebody to, if you're working with a, a, a lathe or a hand tool, you don't want somebody to plug it in and automatically have power there. You'd rather have the user to be forced to manually reset the ground fault and know that there's power there. The automatic resets units, um, where they come in handy is maybe if you've got something plugged into a sump pump and there's a power outage, when the power comes back on, if you have a piece of equipment that you're going to want to come back on with the power and you don't want somebody to physically have to be there to reset it, then an automatic reset is something you would want to use in those cases. We've had situations where people put, uh, put portable ground faults in cell tower applications that are unmanned, and you know when that power comes back on, you want the GFI to automatically come back on. So that's where you're going to use an automatic reset is typically situations where you want the power to come back on uh, regardless of whether there's any, any people available. Okay, so transitioning from portables, 
which can be used on job sites and the industrial plant and facilities. Um, now we're going to talk more about receptacles. And on the receptacle side, there's a major, major change going into effect on June 29th of 2015, so about 29 days from now. Um, the new UL standard impacts every single manufacturer of ground fault receptacles. And it's going to virtually change every receptacle on the market today. So as of the 29th, Hubble will no longer be allowed to manufacture any of the ground fault receptacles we make today. And that goes for all of our competitors as well. So every single ground fault will change. The new product must have what we call an self-testing feature to it. Okay, so I want to think about, think about your own home, think about your own facility for a minute. How often do you push the test button on your ground fault? You know, your facilities, you know, maybe you're going to be higher than the average population in terms of checking, the, checking ground fault functionality. Um, but in reality, most people can have a ground fault receptacle in place for 10, 15 years, and they're never pushing that test button to make sure the ground fault is protecting itself. So as we talked about earlier, UL's goal is to continue to drive the standard in such a way that ground faults protect more people, save more lives, we have less fatalities. So on June 29th, every ground fault that exists must be self-testing, and it must also deny power in the, in the case of detecting a problem. So every unit has now a microprocessor built into the ground fault. It runs a circuit test, checks for functionality, and tells the user if there's a problem. So you'll see here in section 6.30.8, every ground fault must have either a visual or an audible indicator. So in, in the case of a Hubble ground fault, you now have a microprocessor. It's checking the circuit every minute. It's checking to make sure that ground fault is protecting. And if it finds a problem, it will, it will in 80% in of the cases, it's going to trip the ground fault, and it's not going to allow you to reset that ground fault because it has found a problem with the circuitry, with the functionality of the ground fault. In about 20% of the standards where there's actually something wrong internally with the ground fault from a mechanical tripping standpoint, and it can't physically force itself to trip, in that case, the device by UL requirement must give you a visual or an audible indicator. So it may still provide power, but it's going to have either a flashing light or it's going to have an audible alarm that tells you, hey, there's something wrong here. This receptacle is not protecting people, and you need to change it. So again, two scenarios. 80% of the time, it's going to trip it. You're not going to be able to reset it. You're going to be forced to change that device. In about 20% of the cases, it's going to flash a light or give you an audible signal to tell you that there's a problem. And again, this is a UL standard. Every product must have that. So what does that mean to end users? Uh, from, a, from a pricing standpoint, you can expect the price and the cost of a standard ground fault receptacle to increase by about 40%. So it's a significant design change for the manufacturers to redesign those circuit boards and put microprocessors in. So you will see the cost of ground fault receptacles increase, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, doesn't matter. They're all going to go up. It's all going to be about a 40% uh, cost increase. So externally, minimal change that you're going to see. You're going to see, you know, some added LEDs for the functionality to give you power on indicators, to give you end of life indicators. Internally, the major change, that's where you've got a new double-sided circuit board inside, and it's gonna give us the ability to program it in such a way that we can get that uh, self-testing um, product line. So the ground fault will monitor its ability to provide ground fault protection. So you, you still have the ability as a user to push the test button. We still recommend 
that you have a, a preventive maintenance program and that you're manually testing your ground fault every 30 days. But the new product, every 60 seconds, will check the circuit, make sure it's operating properly, and it'll deny power. Now, the 60 seconds is Hubble standard. Um, the UL requirement is that it tests itself at a minimum every 15 minutes. So every manufacturer can just kind of arbitrarily choose, you know, whether it's five minutes or a minute. Um, any way you look at it, it's going to be safer than the world we have today where people aren't pushing the test and reset buttons um, at all. So as Hubble has redesigned the product, we've actually broadened the offering um, and the availability in terms of, you know, some of the functionality you can get in the product. We've added an isolated ground. We had a lot of college campus facilities with labs where they wanted isolated ground in addition to ground fault. So that's now available with this new UL standard. You now have um, a nightlight version. We see a lot of hotels, residential applications where they want nightlights built in. Um, some people want an audible alarm. You might have a ground fault, you know, a soda machine, a refrigerator, or it's located in the basement or, you know, an area that's not frequently, um, you know, populated. So you want an audible alarm built into that ground fault to tell you if it trips. So there's multiple varieties of new ground fault products that are out on the marketplace in addition to the tamper resistance that um, has been out on the market for about five or six years now. So with this standard, you're going to see some new products from not only Hubble, but from all the manufacturers um, with regards to safety and the ability to, to monitor the circuits, um, et cetera. Um, the last slide that I'll leave you with today is some added resources, and we'll email these links out to you after the presentation. Um, this presentation will also be archived up on the uh, Graybar website for you to access. But there's some very good documents here from OSHA that get into more of the differences between portables and ground faults, the open neutral relay. There's also discussions from the National Electric Code where you need to use portables on job sites, uh, what their requirements are. Um, and then on the Hubble website, there's some technical documents that get into the details on how the auto monitoring works, what the UL standard changes are, um, and what the timeline is. So effective June 29th, I can no longer make the old style product. That doesn't mean you can't use it, you can't install it, it doesn't mean it's not, um, it's not safe. It doesn't mean I can't sell it. It just means we can no longer manufacture it. So if you're a safety person in your facility and you want to improve the safety, does it make sense for you to change out all your ground fault receptacles and go to a self-testing product? Yes, it makes sense and it will make your facility safer. Is it a requirement? No, it's not a requirement. The UL mandate strictly applies to the manufacturing of the device. So from, a, from an end user standpoint or from a contractor standpoint, you're perfectly okay to install the existing product that exists in the marketplace. You don't have to change out every GFI in your home, but if you do want to improve the safety or if you want to improve the safety of your own family, then yes, it, it is a good idea to install one of these new UL 2015 self-testing ground faults. Um, and with that, again, Mindy, I'll let you take it over, and you can uh, you can uh, open it up for questions. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, John. That was a great presentation. At this time, we're going to address some questions that have been submitted. Um, just a reminder, you can still submit questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If we don't get to your question, a Graybar representative will follow up with you after the presentation. Um, first up, what is a better method for determining proper PPE, incident energy analysis or the table method? I, I assume that's for me, right, Mindy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is Dan Neeser again. Uh, that's, that's a great question. And we, we've had some uh, Q&A uh, during the time that we've been presenting as well. Um, in many cases, you will go to a facility and they've done no arc flash hazard analysis. Um, in those cases, we certainly would suggest um, using the, the table method 
um, as guidance on how to uh, properly dress. Um, one section I did not cover um, that probably is of, of importance to our audience is you really want to also look in those cases where we're doing uh, uh, work at a customer site, um, there are responsibilities both for the host employer as well as the contract employers in 110.3 of NFP Day 70E. So um, in those cases, I would really look at the requirements in 110.3 um, and see what we can do. But ultimately, what we happen is we're going to use the table method at first, and then eventually they might go to the analysis method at a later date. All right. So, um, Dan, this is also for you. How can companies verify the equipment is properly installed and maintained? That is a uh, boy. That is the elephant in the room. Uh, that is a very difficult thing. Um, again, what I would recommend our audience to consult with is to look at uh, FPA 70 B as in boy, and uh, that gives guidance for different types of equipment. Um, so 70B is a great document to have uh, in your uh, library uh, that can give you some guidance on maintaining different types of equipment. And it can depend upon, in many cases, the environment as well. If you have a, um, an office location where it's an equipment room and it's an ambient temperature and it's, you know, there's no exposed and dust and all that other stuff, obviously your maintenance will be less than if it's um, in a uh, dusty environment or so forth. Um, also, never forget uh, to look at the operation and maintenance manuals that ship with the equipment. That's a great uh, resource, as well as the instruction sheets. Uh, probably important to start saving those instruction sheets and looking for recommended maintenance on those instruction sheets as well. All right, this one's for John. Does a ground fault receptacle with an audible alarm allow the user to turn the alarm off while arrangements are being made to have the device changed out? Uh, yes, Mindy, it does. And uh, the audible alarm has a muting screw. The muting screw, if, you, if you're familiar with surge receptacles, surge receptacles have the same functionality. Um, it allows the user to turn the muting screw, shut the alarm off, and then schedule an orderly replacement of that device. Good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you touch on what is um, what is the required amount of um, NFPA 70E training for qualified employees? Looks like that one may have been for John as well. John or Dan? No, that's for Dan. Dan? Sorry. Uh, yes, and again, you know, obviously we didn't uh, cover all of NFPA 70E. Um, specifically, I would go to, uh, well, there's a lot of training that you have to, uh, to go to. Um, everyone, if you're asking these questions, uh, you should, your first, uh, what I would recommend is to get a copy of NFPA 70E. And if you go into 110.2, that covers training requirements. And with regard specifically to, and that, that could be any training requirements for both qualified and unqualified. Uh, with regards to the qualified person, you would go into 110.2D1, and that details um, the training requirements for uh, qualified people. But it's, a, it's an extensive list, and it's going to be, I don't want to read text, but 110.2D1 uh, would be the place to go. All right, this one's for John. Is there a timeline in which old GFRs can be used? Um, we have a contractor who would like to know for customers. As, there is no timeline. Um, contractor can have UL listed ground faults from, from this change, from the 2003 change, from the 2008 change. When they were manufactured, they're UL listed, and they're perfectly fine to continue to install and use. Um, the, only, the only person that's impacted is the manufacturer. So gray bar can keep selling them, and users can keep installing them. Manufacturers after June 29th cannot make them, though. All right, thank you. Um, Dan, if we do an arc flash hazard analysis, are we OSHA compliant and don't need to do anything else? That is a, a great, great question. It's something I always, uh, I always hear. And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Um, 
you know, doing the art flash uh, hazard analysis is uh, always the first step to uh, to working safely. However, it is uh, I look at it like a marriage. <laughs> um, getting married is not the end of the road; it's the it's the first start of it. And uh, you need to, you know, the the key thing uh, that you're going to have to do besides just doing an art flash hazard analysis is you need to develop a, an effective electrical safety program and uh, document safe work practices. So there is a ton more than just uh, doing an arc flash study to be compliant with OSHA. All right, thanks. All right, uh, this one is for John. Um, somebody wants to understand if they heard correctly, the auto GFI is a is a requirement by, by July 1st, but existing are grandfathered? That, that is correct. Um, you, can, you don't have to replace anything that's already installed. You can continue to install the pre-June 29th product, and, um, and Graybar can continue to sell the June, pre-June 29th product. The only ramification is Hubble, Leviton, Cooper, P.F. Pass and Seymour, none of the manufacturers can manufacture the product that without the self-testing microchip in it after June 29th. All right. Well, we're about out of time at this point. So if we didn't get to your question, a Graber representative will follow up with you. Um, just a reminder, this presentation is going to be archived on Graybar.com's website. Again, thank you for your time today, and we hope you will join us again for an upcoming G2 talk. Are you guys still on the line? <laughs>